Philippians chapter 4 verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Rejoice. You know, I believe one of the reasons for emphasis is um, need. One of the reasons for emphasis is need. Because you emphasize something because you really, really need or want that thing to be received. So you emphasize it. So the Bible will say something like, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except this and this apples. Verily, verily. When you emphasize, you're trying to say this is important. And there's also a need. The need here is that there's something that is trying to be against it. There's an opposition. So you want to put stress. You want to stress it. You want to establish it and emphasize it and let somebody just get it. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Because whether we like it or not, there will be things around us in our life that would want to stop us from rejoicing. There will be circumstances, there will be situations, there will be happenings, there will be so many things that would like to stop us from rejoicing. So here now, the Bible says, to Paul believed to, we believe it's Paul to the Philippians, says rejoice in the Lord all the time. Again, I say rejoice. In other words, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what is happening all around you, whether you are full to it or you don't have full to it, no matter what you're having to face, no matter what the trouble of this world is bringing into your plate, no matter what is going on, I say to you, rejoice. Because it's important to understand that the only way we can keep rejoicing all the time is if we rejoice in the Lord. And I believe this is the most important thing I want to let us know today. Happiness is fine. We can get excited when some things are happening in our life. When we've just maybe bought a new house, a new car, got promotion, more money, or, you know, getting married, having children, and, 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 and all of those things. We, 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 we get excited because we have good happenings in our life. Then what do you do when the happenings are not that good? What do you do when you're still expecting the miracle? What do you do when you're, 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 you're not there yet? What do you do when the things that you have in your life are not looking exactly the way you want them to do just before you get to the miracle, just before you get the car, just before you get the new job, just before you get the promotion? What do you do when there's not thing going on that is particularly good? Because at that time then, what you want to do is to become gloomy and sad because there are no good things going on around. But I want to tell you something. The Bible is saying rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say to you, rejoice. For you to maintain the expression of the joy of the Lord in your heart, it has to be in the Lord. Amen. It has to be in the Lord. In the Lord. Jesus said, in the world you will have problems and tribulations. In the world there will be disappointments. In the world there will be confusion. In the world there will be all of that. He said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the Lord, rejoice always. Not in any other thing but in the Lord. I can rejoice for a few days if not in the Lord. If you take the Lord out of it, you cannot rejoice all the time. Hallelujah. The Bible says, let us therefore because of him, in him, offer the sacrifice of praise continually. There are things you cannot do except you do it in Christ. You know why? Because every other thing will change. Things will go up and down and fluctuate. But you have to build your life on something that is solid and then you are sure to be stable all the time. So if I want to rejoice all the time, I have to find a basis for my rejoicing that doesn't change. Glory to God. I have to find the basis for my rejoicing that can 
be altered. I have to find the basis of my rejoicing that nobody can take away from me. Psalm 16 verse 11. You will show me the path of life. Your presence in your presence is the fullness of joy. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Not in the world, not in my life, uh, not in anything. I was, I was counseling with someone. I was explaining to somebody. I think I've told us before. You know, it, like in marriage, I want to say something here that is very serious. You know, in marriage, if you're not careful, you will say, I am not happy in this marriage. Or I am not happy with my spouse. Now, you should be happy with your spouse. You should be. You should be happy in your marriage. But you see, there's a fundamental error here. If the source of your joy is your spouse, you are in trouble. Because it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. No matter how beautiful your marriage is, your wife should never take the place of God. No matter how beautiful your marriage is, your husband should never take the place of God. Listen to this. The source of your joy can be your spouse. And you, you know what? Let me just say this. You know, when you think like that, you put human beings in a category that they can't carry. You put expectation upon their life they can't bear. Because if you, if my wife expects me to be the source of a joy, then I'm in trouble. Because now, how can I really contend with God? You know, you are putting me in competition with the Almighty. And I, I'm going to fail you. I'm, I guarantee you I'll fail you. Even if I couldn't, I have to. I, I should fail you. Because you're putting me in competition with God Almighty. Listen to this. Nothing in this world should be the source of your joy outside of God. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. That's why people get it wrong. People who get this wrong, their marriage is going to be in distress. It's going to be in pain. Their relationship will be scattered. Because they're expecting from man what they should get from God. A man will fail. But when you get it from God, when God is the source, it will permeate into other areas of your life. And you're going to find that happiness in all of those things automatically. Am I talking to somebody? Am I talking to somebody? God is the source of everything. In the presence of the Lord. For in your presence there is fullness. Everybody say fullness. Not partial. You know, it's not, it's not scarcely, sparsely. No, it's fullness. Complete joy. Fullness of joy. All manner of joy. <laughs> Whatever dimension of joy you want. You want. In, the, in your presence there is fullness of joy and at its right hand. Everybody say his right hand. Uh, our pleasures forevermore. Uh, the right and always speak of strength. Um, what he's saying is you will enjoy the strength, the flow, the provisions of God. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. You have joy in Christ. You have joy. But why are we talking about being joyful? Be joyful. Why are we talking about that? Because you have to be deliberate not to choose sadness. You have to be deliberate not to choose misery. You have to be deliberate not to choose distress and depression. You have to be deliberate. I'm telling the truth. You have to be. You have to be. It's like on Friday when we're talking about being courageous. You know, you choose to be. Nobody's going to do it for you. You have to do it. This is what I cannot do it. No, yes, you can. Because you have the grace of God working in your life. You have to choose it deliberately. You have to turn your back on distress. You have to turn your back on sadness. You have to turn your back on misery. It's something you have to do. That's why it says rejoice. In the Lord. You know when it says in the Lord, it cancels all your excuses. When it says in the Lord, it cancels all your excuses. Because the Lord cannot fail. The Lord cannot change his address. The Lord doesn't fluctuate. What he said about you is not going to change his mind. Whatever it is in the Lord has been, will be, and forever shall be. Praise God. So when he says in the Lord, he's trying to cancel all our, all our excuses. And say, you know what? Make the choice. Can you hear me tell somebody, make the right choice? Tell the person rejoice. Tell the person rejoice. Tell the person the joy of the Lord is your strength. Tell the person rejoice. 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 
show, to rejoice is to show great joy and delight. To rejoice is to show great happiness. Uh, to rejoice is to show great happiness about something. But close, listen to this now. So now imagine if the source, if the reason for your joy is Jesus. Look at some is 30 person. Jesus is always happening. <laughs> uh, say, Jesus is always uh, happening. There is not a time that Jesus doesn't happen. There's not a time that Jesus is weak and tired and turns his back on us. No, he is always happening. So if my happening is Christ, why should I rejoice all the time? I rejoice all the time because I'm not rejoicing in things. I am rejoicing in somebody. I am rejoicing in a person. And you know what? That person is Jesus Christ. He will never fail. Hallelujah. He will not back out on me. Glory to God. He is Jesus. I am rejoicing in him. I am rejoicing in him. I'm rejoicing because of everything God has done for me. I'm rejoicing because of salvation. Listen to this. Let the source of your joy not be material things. Let the source of your joy not be things all around you. Let the source of your joy not be something that can change, something that can diminish, something that locusts can eat up. Let not the source of your joy be something that is just temporal. Let the source of your joy be something that is eternal. It changes the game. It changes everything. It changes your position. It changes your perception. It changes the way you see things. People expect you to cry, but why should you cry when the things they expect to bring you cry doesn't bring you joy? Oh, you didn't get that. Uh, you know, because what you're thinking I should cry on, even if it's positive, it's not the source of my joy. I can rejoice because of it, and I can't cry because of it. Am I talking to anybody here? Because your rejoicing should be in the Lord. Start, start thinking now all of those things that bring sadness to your heart and just switch to the Lord who doesn't fail. Hallelujah. Psalm 118 verse 15 the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents, the tabernacle, the house, the home of the righteous. The voice of rejoicing can you hear me tell somebody the voice of rejoicing is in your house? Tell the person it's not coming to your house, it's in your house. Tell the person it's not arriving in your house, it's in your house. It's not will come to your house, it's in your house. It's not on its way to your house, it's in your house. It's not going to come tomorrow, it's in your house. It's not going to come after this service, it's in your house. That's what the Bible says. And I just have this weakness. I just believe the word of God the way it is. I just believe it. That's what it says. Because you see, if you're not careful, you are going to judge God's word with your experiences. But you let the word of God judge your experiences. That's what you do. You don't judge God's word with your experiences. You do the reverse. The word of God judges your experiences. The word of God becomes the standard. Hallelujah. The word of God becomes the constitution. The word of God becomes the law. The word of God becomes the precept, the principle, the standard. You see, the word of God becomes the standard upon which everything in our life is judged, not the other way around. Praise God. So if the Bible said the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in my tent if I can't find it God has not failed I have to bring myself in alignment with God's word amen because the word of God is tested seven times he's tested forever it's the same so powerful I remember one day I will share something you know God's word is so powerful I was listening to one guy I some of them I know him the guy is a professor in Oxford mathematics but I like him a lot. John, John, John Lennox or whatever his name is. The guy is so good. He's a scientist, a mathematician. When he talks about how he understands God through maths. Jesus Christ. You will know that atheists are stupid. When he explains mathematics and science. And how God speaks in words. And how mathematics is a way to express God's words. It just, you know, I just, sometimes I just listen to it and sleep off. Because uh, I sometimes I don't even know whether I understand everything they say. But I just enjoy people like that. 
is so powerful. And, and then he says, he says, you know, you just, you just see that this thing is so powerful. God's word is powerful. You, that's why you have to believe it to feel it. You have to believe it to see it. You, you know why you have to believe God before you see God? Because God is bigger than us and he's trying, trying to impress you. It's not taunting us or teasing us or trying to tantalize us or trying to impress us so that he can do some things and then you believe him. And, and that's what the devil got wrong with Job. And, and, and he said, Job doesn't trust you for nothing. The guy wants some food. And God said, no. There are a few people who understand that I am good enough to be loved whether I give them food or not. He said, but listen to this, Satan. After I have proven that to you, I will also let you know that I will still give them food. Somebody say, Amen. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. It's in your tent. Believe it. That's the word of God. Don't look at your circumstances. Listen to this. There are many things that are true that you can't prove. Believe this. And you see, the proof of God's word is in manifestation. And those who have believed and have experienced it, they know beyond every doubt, reasonable or unreasonable, that this word is true. Look at some type of person, it is true. The voice of rejoicing is in your house. But the question is, are you righteous? Are you righteous? I am not talking about those who do right things. I'm talking about those that God has gifted his righteousness. I'm not talking about those who got everything right. Your hands can be clean and go to hellfire. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those who have received the righteousness of God. I'm talking about those who have accepted that all our own righteousness is they are like filthy rags. I'm talking about those who have believed him like Abraham. And the Bible says it was imputed to him as righteousness. To impute is to reckon. It's an accounting term. It's to give it to you. It's to do your records and say this that you have done is equal to this. So when you believe, it's imputed into you for righteousness. Hallelujah. We don't work for it. We believe for it. Hallelujah. We don't sweat for it. We believe for it. But when you believe for it, you will experience it. You want to start from the physical. You start from the spirit. And you will land in the physical. What do I mean? You will see physical expression of the truth in your life. Haven't you seen people that just get excited all the time? The devil tries to beat them down. They don't even really feel it. You try to discourage them, they are undiscourageable. <laughs> you, know, you can't just do it. Have you not seen people who are just like that? Because of the spirit of God at work in them? Do you know you are also like that? If only you can tune yourself to that spirit of the living God. The voice of rejoicing is in the tent of the righteous. And if you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, if you have accepted Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that voice of rejoicing and salvation is in your house. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's in your house. Not coming into your house is in your house. Don't let the devil shut you down. And that's why we're talking about rejoicing. That's why you're talking about fullness of joy. The expressions, the outpouring of it, the overflowing of it. Because when you believe in God, it's in you. It's not happiness. It's joy we're talking about. We're not talking about something that comes and goes. When you feel great today, you don't feel great tomorrow. You're dependent. You're living on happiness. Live on joy. You know, some days are a great day for you. You're excited, you're happy, and then tomorrow your mood is down. Because something bad happened. Be in control of the happenings. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Can you do it? No. With your own power, you can't. But if it's in the Lord, if it's in the Lord, the Lord will do what he wants in your life. The voice of rejoicing is in the tent of the righteous. God in Christ Jesus has removed every pain. Say amen. God in Christ Jesus has taken every sorrow. God in Christ Jesus has removed everything that brings sadness. God in Christ Jesus has taken away those things. You have to believe what is done for you. Be joyful. 
You have joy in your bones. You have joy in your heart. You have joy in your spirit. You have joy in your system. The voice of rejoicing is in your tent. Don't let the devil shut you down. Don't let the devil keep you sad. It's in your tent. Don't wait for things to change. Change from the inside. Don't wait for the happenings to be beautiful. No, the beauty is from the inside. He makes my life so beautiful. You might not see it because you can't see the things of the spirit, but I know in my spirit, anybody here, you know you're beautiful on the inside. You know you're beautiful. Your spirit is beautiful. You know something beautiful is inside of you. Now, that's why you rejoice, not if something wrong happens on the outside. We rejoice in the Lord. And I want to challenge somebody, let that joy flow. Can you hear me tell somebody, let that joy flow. Tell the person, let the joy flow. Tell the person, be joyful. Let the joy flow. Let it flow, let it come out, let it radiate, let people see it. Let people love it, just let it flow. Don't lock it up. Isaiah 53, surely has borne our griefs. Look at some dead person, surely. He has borne our griefs and sicknesses and weaknesses and diseases and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, speaking by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. Surely. 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 He carried your sorrows. Surely. Every sorrow you express is foreign. It's not yours. As a child of God, every sorrow you express is not your sorrow. Oh, yes. No, he's carried your sorrow. You have to believe it. You have to walk in line with it. You have to stay in line with it. Listen to this. You know, somebody say, boy, it's not possible. It is possible. There are people who are going through what you're going through. They're not sorrowful. That's to prove to you that it's possible. You can be sorrowful because you don't have money, but I'm telling the truth. There are people who don't have money, but they're not sorrowful. That's already a proof. You can be sorrowful that you don't, you're not married yet, but there are single people who are not sorrowful. It's perception that is determining your expression. But you see, if you change your mind and tell yourself, I believe what the Lord says about me, he has carried my sorrows. And that, that devil is going to be angry, but that's good. That devil is going to wonder, what's wrong with you? And that's good. That devil is going to wonder, why is it that he, you know, this guy can't feel it? Because there's nothing in it to feel there's power and deliverance in the name of Jesus. He has taken away my sorrows. He has taken away your sorrow. He has carried them away. He has been wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquity. The punishment that brought you peace was upon him. Peace. You, you need to be joyful. What, what, what is, listen, what are you looking for? What do you want the Lord to do for you that he hasn't done? Saved your life from the pit of hell. Delivered you from the power of sickness and diseases and, 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 and sin. You know, we're not just saved from sin. We're delivered from the power of sin. That's why sin cannot have mastery over you. You know, a Christian who says it's not me, it's the devil. is a Christian who doesn't understand what he's been delivered from. Why won't you be joyful? Why? Don't let anything steal your praise. Habakkuk said, though the fig tree may not blossom, not the fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will join the God of my salvation. Hallelujah. Look at that. Just imagine in an economy where everybody has to be a farmer. And then every crop has failed. And then every animal failed. What's left? Nothing. I don't think there's any form of farming outside of crop farming and animal farming. I don't think there's anyone in between. Insect farming. That's the animal. Amen. 
Now everything failed. And Habakkuk said, even at this time, he says, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Because my joy is not in the crop. My joy is not in the fig tree. My joy is not in the olives. If what brought him joy was only the wine press, then the, it's gone. And that's why you don't, you don't meddle with just happiness, happening happiness. Because if you get excited only when things are exciting, so what happens when things are not exciting? You lose your excitement. What happens when things go wrong? So, but for this guy, he says, no, 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 no. Because if I look at the fig tree, I'll be full of sadness. If I look at the vines, I will be full of sadness. If I look at the labor of the olive, I will be full of sadness. If I look at the food in the field, there is none, I'll be full of sadness. If I look into the flock, if I look into the fold, if I look into the earth in the stalks, I will be full of sadness. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to look into all of those things. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Oh, come on, let me tell somebody, rejoice in the Lord. Not in the olives, not in the figs, not in the wine press, not in the houses, not in the lands, not in the job, not in the promotion, not in a new car, a new house, not in a new shoe. No, 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 no. Rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Listen to this. You can run from pillar to post and think you're going to be excited when you are masked off. There are people who have more. I mean more than what you are running after and they still don't have peace. There are people who have more. No, by the time I have loads of money, then I will begin to serve the Lord and rejoice. You won't serve God. The more the blessing you have, if you can't serve God with small blessing, when they become bigger, you won't serve him. In the workers meeting, I was sharing something with them about the excuses that people gave to Jesus Christ. And one said, I've just bought a new land, uh, so let me go. The, another one said, I, I've just bought a yoke of oxen, let me go. And the other one said, I've just gotten married, let me go. Because for most people who give God excuses, they use the blessing of God against God. Three massive excuses. If the guy had no land, he would have followed Jesus. That's what he said. He said, Jesus, it's your fault. God, it's your fault. You gave me capacity to buy a land. Now that I've got a land, I can't follow you. I've got to take care of my land. And then the other guy said, you know what? It's your fault. You gave me too much money. Now I just have to spend my money. I bought a new oxen. I don't have time for God. I'll go and just take care of my oxen. It's your fault. And the other guy said, it's your fault also. You know, if I didn't have anybody to marry, I'll be in church. But now I married a new wife. And, and so I don't have time for God. Can you see? All of them give excuses based on the blessings of their life. If you want to be sincere, now watch it a minute. If you want to be sincere, look at all the reasons why you don't serve God well and I will tell you 90% of them is because you are blessed. If you're shut down, you don't have food to eat, you don't have clothes to wear, you'll be serving God and praying and fasting. Why do we use God's blessing against him? Why do we do it? Why do we do it? But you know the beautiful thing, it's not because of that stop blessing you. So that on the day of judgment, you have no excuse. Because God will not say, you know, you won't say, God, is because I didn't have it. People always say they have that, they have, they don't serve God. Got a new business appointment. If you didn't have a job, you will serve God more. Believe me. At least so that I can give you a job. <laughs> Amen. He will fast and pray. At least so that miracle can happen. Don't use the blessings of God against God as excuses. Like those guys who wants to go and see their land and see their wife and see their oxen. Rejoice in the Lord. Don't let anything steal your service or your praise or your joy and any of those things. Let Jesus be the center of your joy. Let it be the reason why you move, the reason why you stop, the reason why you aspire, the reason why you are ambitious, the reason why. Let Jesus be everything, the reason why I want to move forward. And once he's the center of your joy, you will never use the blessing of the Lord as excuses against him. 
people who are not busy, they don't have excuses. It's only busy people. I analyzed in the first service, you know, how it's normal that the more you're blessed, the busier you become. It's the truth. But we must now be careful not to turn that to excuses. But it's the truth. The more, as you get in place, I was using property as an example. If you don't want to have responsibility for your life, then you rent forever. If you decide to buy your own, you become responsible because you're not going to call any landlord. Then you decide that you're going to be Oliver Twist. You buy another house. Now, it's not just that you can't call landlord. People will call you. You see now. And then by the time you now want to do another one and you do four or five, then you know you have put yourself into trouble. So you become busier. So blessing comes with responsibility and we become busier. But God will never expect us to use those blessings as excuses. He has to be the center. Center doesn't mean middle. It means it's the pivot, it's the fulcrum. It's what binds everything together. It's the reason, the essence of it. Center doesn't mean God is in the middle of my life. It means God is my life. Look at some person. what's the center of your joy? Or who is the center of your joy? Hallelujah. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Happiness is fickle. It requires happy circumstances. Joy on the other hand sticks around. Joy stays with you. Joy doesn't move anywhere. You know why? It's in your house. So what you need to do is to let it flow. Look at some dirty person. Let it flow. Let it, let it flow. Tell the person you have joy. Tell the person you have joy. Ah, come on, let them hear you well. Tell the person you have joy. Tell the person you cannot have Christ and not have joy. Come on, preach to somebody. You cannot have Christ and not have joy. You cannot have Christ and not have peace. You cannot. It cannot happen. This is the voice of rejoicing and salvation. It's in the tent of the righteous. It's not coming in. It's in there. But you got to let it go. You got to let it flow. Hallelujah. And that's what we're talking about. Rejoicing. Being joyful. Let it come out. Let it flow. Let that devil be angry. Let the devil be annoyed. Express joy. No matter what is happening. The devil thought you should be sorry for yourself and keep on crying. But you're smiling. You know every time you're smiling when the devil thinks you should cry, he is sad. And whatever you do to make that devil sad, do it well. Do it again. All right. Do it again and again and again and again. As long as the devil is mad, you're fine. The enemy will not rejoice over you. Hallelujah. Psalm 5:11. But let those who rejoice, let those, let those rejoice who put their trust in you. Oh, let those rejoice. Let the people who put their trust in God rejoice. That's what they say. Let the people, those who put their trust in God, let them rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because God defends them. Let those who love the name of the Lord be joyful in God. Be joyful in what? In God. Isaiah 61 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Not in things around. Amen. You know some people, if you scratch their car, they're not going to sleep for two days. Scratching of a car can take their joy away. You're in trouble. You should feel bad. I'm not saying go around scratching people's car, alright? That's what I'm saying. But I'm just saying don't take it too seriously. Don't kill yourself because of it. Some people, if the button of their jackets comes off, they lose peace. Don't let your joy be in those things. They change. They're too temporal. They go up and down. They fluctuate. Don't let your joy go like that. That's why you don't just depend on happiness based on the happenings around you. I will re- greatly rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has closed me with 
garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robes of righteousness. All of those things we're talking about in those separate scriptures. Can you see all of them coming together now? Rejoicing in the Lord, coming here now. Joyful in my God, coming here now. Talking about the garments of salvation, coming in here now. Covered with me with robes of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornament and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Amen. I know some of us don't like jewels, some of us do, but listen to this, whether you like it or not, it's an adornment. And so, the Bible says that as, as, as these apples, now, now take your eyes away from the physical and see in the spirit, what the Bible is saying is this, in the spirit we are being decorated by God. Hallelujah. There's beauty in your life. Look at some third person who's made your life so beautiful. Oh, tell the person your life is so beautiful. <laughs> tell the person people might not see it, but your life is so beautiful. Tell the person it's not based on what you're wearing on the physical. It's a spiritual thing. He has clothed us with a robe of righteousness, decked us with ornaments, uh, decked us and adorned us with jewels. That now, I don't have time. I will tell you about that. There are so many spiritual decorations. So many. You are forgiven adopted hallelujah you are set free you are mastery over the devil you are you are made you are in the image and the likeness of god you are not begging for bread you are on top you're not beneath your life has been embellished by god with so many wonderful things that's why you should rejoice amen you should rejoice you might not have money to buy a gold wristwatch. When you get to heaven, you will walk on the streets of gold. What everybody considers so important on earth, in heaven, we will tread on it. <laughs> Amen. That's why you should rejoice. That's why you should rejoice. Why would I not rejoice that I've been delivered from the power of sin and that I'm not a slave to sin? Why shouldn't I rejoice? I can choose to live the life of God by the grace of God. Why can't I rejoice that I can stand to forgive people without any stress? Why can't I rejoice that I don't keep malice, I don't have to hold offenses? Why can't I rejoice? You have so much going on in your life that is so powerful. If you're sad, you choose sadness. Don't wait until everything is perfect around. There will be challenges. Has been given to us not to be only to believe in Christ but also to suffer for his sake. There'll be challenges that one or two things that should be in place. This is part of life. Hello, if you want to advance in your career, don't you do exams? Is doing exams a bad thing? No, it's just because it's going to take you to a higher level. True or false? It's not a bad thing, it's part of life. Do exam every day. Any day you stop doing things that you don't have anything that to challenge your brain. I'm sorry for you. So we keep doing stuff. But it's not a disadvantage. That's the way it is. Hallelujah. Psalm 4, 7. Oh, I like this. Psalm 4, 7. Psalm 4, verse 7. You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvest. Let's go back to Abacook. What Abacook was saying, I wanted to just oppose that on this one. And then you, you see, what he's saying is this. You know, Abacook said, the fig might not bring anything, there might not be this, I will rejoice in the Lord. Now move on to this one now. Now, it, this one now says, you have given me greater joy. What it is, put the of them together. Even if the fig tree blossoms, even if the olive is flowing with oil and the wine press, even if the flock is everywhere and the stall is full, said the joy that I have in the Lord is more than that. Why should I now let that go? Because of something that is happening. I, I don't know if you get anybody understand what I'm trying to say. I pray that the Holy Spirit will explain to you. What you have is too powerful. Plus or minus of harvest, you have joy. And that's why he's saying that you have given me greater joy 
than those who have abundant harvest of grain and new wine. And you know that very well. In reality, this is not fables. You know there are people who have more money than you have. They don't have half of the peace you have. True or false? There are people who have things happening in their life that you are still trusting God for, but they are beating themselves up in their marriage every day. There are people who make money you can make in one month, uh, in one day, and yet their marriage is in this array, and their life is not together, and their children it will be cursing them and wife will be slapping the husband and they listen to this you need to understand life is more than all of those things but when you have the joy of the lord whether those things are or they are not your joy is untouchable praise god praise god you might not have it you might have them you will have everything that God says is yours. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is don't build your life and your joy on those things. I am very sure that almost every adult in this auditorium will probably have had one or two things in our life that is not in line with the way we would have preferred. Am I talking to anybody here? What's bad about that? When I have concluded that my joy is not going to be dependent on those things so keep your joy flowing let's quickly go through a few things that will help us to keep the joy flowing because i'm telling you you have joy abundance of joy abundant joy the joy of the lord is your strength tell the person the joy is in your house it's in your marriage it's in your life it's already in your tabernacle it's there Tell the person, we got to bring it out. <laughs> we want it to flow. We want it to flow. Overflowing joy. We want it to flow. We want it to rejoice. We want it to flow. And so one of the things we're going to be talking about is things that can stop you from flowing, but you don't want them to stop you from flowing until you have to do something about them. How do I get it flowing? Live your life by the word of God. Number one. Live your life by the word. And, and, and that, that, that includes a lot of things. You must believe the word of God. You must live the word of God. You must believe everything that Jesus did for you. Listen to this. That Jesus should be the center of your joy. Live by the word of God. Live by those things that God told you. Hallelujah. Listen to this. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. If I'm expectant of a good thing, I'll start dancing right now. Live by the word of God. In the word, there will be tribulation, but be of good cheer in Christ. There will be joy and celebration live by the word of God it's so important you're going to have opposing thoughts uh, people are going to say negative things um, the news will be negative the, everything will be negative situations might be negative but listen to this live by the word of God the word of God will guarantee your peace and your joy no matter the situation hallelujah the comfort you're looking for is in the word the peace you're looking for is in the word the, the, the encouragement you're looking for is in the word live by the word of God I am not promising that there will not be contradictory positions, but live by the word of God. Number two, please don't dwell on your past mistakes. Uh, most people on earth have done <laughs> something wrong before. Okay? <laughs> don't let anybody come here and deceive you. Most people, the only person that lived on earth didn't do anything wrong was Jesus Christ. But you see, you're not in that class because, you know, uh, because Jesus Christ is the very nature of God. Paul did a lot of things wrong. You, yeah, yeah, of course. Peter, don't even go there. David, ooh, Abraham, Jesus Christ. Who do you want to mention? Just move on. Let me tell somebody, tell the person, just move on. Get beyond your mistakes. Don't let your mistakes define you. Don't let, listen to this. You got it wrong, but don't become a wrongdoer. Don't give yourself a name based on your mistakes. You know, because we do it to Bible characters, we do it to ourselves. Like in the Bible, we have the prodigal son. The Bible didn't say it. But we are used to naming people because of their problem. So, so a pastor can want to preach, and I want to preach the story of the prodigal son. The Bible didn't say that. 
The Bible said he spent his money riotously. He spent his money in a prodigal way. The Bible didn't call him a prodigal son. The Bible said he's the second son or the younger son. The Bible didn't say he's a prodigal son. But human being, we call him the prodigal son. The Bible explained what he did and didn't call him by that name. But human beings, we, we preach millions of messages on the prodigal son. The Bible didn't say that. The Bible just told us how he spent his money. He was prodigal with his spending, but didn't change him. His father was still his father. When you call him a prodigal son, you change the father. You change the title. That's not who the guy is. And the Bible never for once called the guy a prodigal son. Read your Bible. But we are used to naming people. He's a drunkard. We, we like it. We understand. And so we must be careful how we name stuff. But what I want to tell you is this. People can name you, you don't name yourself with a bad name. Go to God, seek repentance, cry in sackcloth and ashes. God will forgive, move on. Let me tell you, neighbor, tell the person, move on. Because if not, you're just being, being, you're being sorrow. We talked about David the other day. You know, David, David was just in unnecessary sorrow. Unnecessary. With sackcloth and ashes trying to turn the hand of God. Because some of us like that prayer. Say, David, pray with sackcloth and ashes. You know, wh wh why? God told him, this is what's going to happen. Then David was in sackcloth and ashes trying to change it. And you think that's a good prayer? He should have started going to church since. Because, God, so because what God said he was going to do did not change. He just wasted his time. Repent and align yourself with the word of God. To obey is better than sacrifice and to act in than the fat of rams. Many people are praying and fasting as they are the fat of rams. Instead of simple obedience. I guarantee you by every standard of scripture, there is no fasting and prayer that is superior to obeying the word of God. And Christians do it. You see, they just think you can bribe God. They just say, I will fast for 21 days and 21 nine and something will move. Oh, come on. You are keeping malice. Oh, come on. Come out of it. There are people you don't talk to over your dead body. You can even fulfill the simple scripture. You're fasting for 40 nights and 40 days and old God bound. Can you see how we can be very, very funny? Move on. Move on well. Praise God. All of those, I, I, that's, I, I've, I've actually mentioned some of the stuff, but I will just give you for those who are writing for numbers. Don't allow worry to steal your joy. Worry is a stealer. If you're a warrior, you can meditate well. What is worrying? Worrying is meditating on the wrong stuff. Worrying and meditation, they are the same process. Is to dwell and ruminate and dwell and ruminate, pour it out, take it in and dwell on words or opinions or ideas. When it's worry, you're dwelling on the, the, the content is satanic. The content is negative. The content is destructive. But then the Bible wants you to do the same with the word of God. Look at some therapists say, we're back on the word now. <laughs> do the same with the word of God. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't let worry steal it. Don't let fear steal your joy. Fear. Fear, 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 fear. Fear, fear is not good at all. Fear is bad. Fear, what fear does is it will punish you now for the things that will never happen. It will punish you now. Fear, fear is, a, is, a, is, a, <laughs> is advanced punishment. Fear is advanced punishment. You just get punished for something that might not happen. Punished by losing your peace, you losing your joy, getting angry, being discouraged, and so on and so forth. Fear just punishes you for something that cannot happen. And you feel the pain, the agony. What happens if I lose my job? Enjoy the job now, please. Uh -uh. What happens if I can't pay my mortgage? You know, you are in fixed mortgage rate for five years. You are still in first year of the five years. You are worrying for four years time. Who has done this to you? Fear. Guilt. Ask your neighbor, are you guilty over anything? Tell the person it's not worth it. Guilt destroys. How do you get over guilt? Is simple. 
go to God. Lay it bare. Open your heart. Hide nothing. Make it plain. Express yourself. It's better to cry in the presence of God than to cry for Satan to rejoice. Go and settle the matter and move on. Guilt, if you like, stay in guilt. It doesn't make God love you or hate you more. But the only person you are <laughs> is the devil that is excited. Listen to this. I know somebody is saying, Pastor, you don't know ah, what I did. No, really, I don't need to really know. It's not important for me to know. But you see, if you want to be delivered from guilt, you need God to know. David said, it is you, only you have I sinned against. You have to. Whatever is building the guilt, just go to God. Amen. Say, Daddy, Father, whatever you want to say, just lay it before the presence of the Lord. And when you get out from the presence of the Lord, walk with boldness and rejoice and be joyful. Anybody that knows about it, let them stay in your yesterday. It's not your headache. Truth. Move on. Do you know sometimes people want to move on, they want to be excited, and then they will remember something, they will become sad. Hello? They're, they're excited. They're just excited. You know, they are just doing, hey, life is going, life is going. Then they will remember one thing, and they will become excited. God has not brought you to your remembrance. It's Satan. How do I know? Into the sea of forgetfulness, I placed all of your sins. That's it. So you see, guilt destroyed. Let the joy flow. Look at some 30 person. Let the joy flow. Don't hold on to offenses. Please don't do it. How can you be joyful when you are full of malice? Joy and malice cannot stay together. No. Don't hold on to offenses. You know, listen to this. You know, when I say don't hold on to offenses. Now, with all due respect, do you know there are many people listening to me right now, they don't have problem with offenses? Join that camp. There are people here, they don't have problem with offenses. They don't have any fight with anybody. They're not angry with anybody. There's nobody they, they need to forgive or they are planning to forgive. They don't have... There are people like that listening to me now. I know that. Why do I know there are people like that listening to me? Because I am like that. And I know I am not special. So I know there are many people listening to me who are also like that. But in case you are someone who hold on to offenses, break loose, break free. You are by yourself forfeiting your own mercy. They that of self-lying vanities, they forsake their own mercy. That's what Jonah says. You forsake your own joy. You forsake your own mercy. You are holding on to offenses. You know, as I was saying in the first service, you know, somebody walks in the room with confidence, with swag. Into a room. And then where you, you are sitting down. Your heart is going. <laughs> Can you not see that you are the one suffering? The person doesn't care about how you feel. The person doesn't even know you are feeling bad. The person might even come to you and greet you and say, Oh, Sister Lisa, how are you doing today? You are shaking the hand. Your heart is shaking. You are suffering. You are suffering. Stop suffering. It's not worth it. And that's not Satan. That's you. Because if it's Satan, it will have killed you. It's not Satan. Satan is, the guy is dangerous, you know. It's, that's not Satan. That's you. That's you. That's you that needs to tell yourself, you know what? I got to let go. Back to the word. How do you sort it down? Go back to God. Go back to God. Sort it out. Move on. If you can confront it, confront it. If you don't need to confront it, don't confront it. Just you free yourself. Why live in consistent pain when the person that's offended you is enjoying life? They don't care about you. Sometimes when I'm teaching people about taking responsibility for your life, I explain to people, you see, it's someone, someone who has, somebody can deliberately make you feel bad. And the person who has deliberately make you feel bad, they don't need your forgiveness. They don't want it. Whether you forgive them or you don't forgive them, it doesn't change them. So you suffer yourself when you live in unforgiveness. Even if you can't get to them, get yourself free. It takes your joy away. If you want to be joyful, let people go. When you let people go, you let yourself loose. When you let people go, you let yourself free. 
when you let people go, you enjoy it more. Because sometimes the people you are holding don't even know you are holding them. And if they find out you are holding them, they don't care. So in both ways, you are losing. Change your mind. Forgive people. Look at the person. Hold somebody's hand. Tell the person you have the grace to let go and let God. Tell the person you have the grace to enjoy your life. last one and then we'll pray you must always expect positive and divine outcomes don't be a pes don't be pessimistic don't always expect bad outcome because it will steal your joy expect you know i didn't just say expect positive outcome i say positive and divine outcome divine outcome the bible god makes it clear he said <laughs> he said as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts amen god says i have a plan for you to give you a future and a hope another translation is to give you expected the end God loves you more than you can ever think or imagine. I'll tell you. L listen to this. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. I want you to resolve within yourself that God loves you more than you can ever think or imagine. And that's not just words. It's true. You know why? Because God is love. You are not. You, we are only trying to align ourselves with the love of God. God loves us more than we can imagine and understand. And that's why sometimes we suffer. When we're not supposed to suffer because we cannot grasp the love of God. May the Lord reveal his love to you. May you understand the depth of God's love for yourself, for your life, for you. May you understand it because it changes the way you see things, the way you carry yourself. Once you grasp, let me tell you something. Once you understand that, you know the end is well. You are landing well. Amen. You are landing well. You might not understand the journey, but the end is well. Amen. There might be <laughs> whatever, potholes on the way. The end is well. Let's stand on our feet. Hallelujah. The Bible makes it very clear. Those words, they straightforward. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacle of the righteous. So if you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that means that the voice of rejoicing is in your house. It's not going to come. It's not will come. It's in your house. You have to make up your mind to walk with God, align yourself with the Holy Spirit, and let the joy of God flow in your life. You can be joyful. It's a choice you have to make because God has already done it for you. You cannot have Christ and have sadness. The joy of the Lord is indeed your strength. But you got to let it flow. By walking in line with God, trusting the Holy Spirit, and making the right choices. Align yourself with God's word and it will surprise you how beautiful your life will turn out to be. Lift those hands up. I'm going to say, Lord, I thank you.